We're going to take a look at inverse functions. Turn right over here. Inverse functions. Now we'll work with a derivative of an inverse, but the first thing we're going to do is kind of go back and look at what we did algebraically with inverses. Okay. An inverse, right? This is where it was a reflection over line y equals x. It's a reflection over the line y equals x. So maybe something like this. So y equals x. That line going at about, well, at about, at 45 degrees. So if this, for example, was f, that's f of x, then this would be f inverse of x. Now, I'm not the best drawer, but those should look like a mirror image of each other over that dotted line. So it's reflected over. One's the original, one's the inverse. And it doesn't matter which one the original is. If this was the original, then this one's the inverse. It's just that reflection back and forth. What you may remember it as on inverses is where you switched x and y. That should sound familiar. Inverses, we switched x and y. Switch x and y. So kind of take a look at a point here. Let's say we had the point 1, 3. If you switch x and y, 1, 3 would become 3, 1. And then you can see the reflection, if I draw that dotted line back in, where those two points would match up. So that's why we switched x and y. So even if we were looking at a larger graphical representation like this, you know, let's say this point right here is 0, 4. Well, that means this point is 4, 0. X and Y switched. X and Y switched because it was that reflection over the line Y equals X. Are you okay with that? Alright, so... A function has an inverse that is a function if it is one to one. Now some basic ideas of inverses. You should remember, do I, would I expect you to remember, hey, one-to-one -one and things like that? No, not necessarily. About the only thing you kind of expected to remember at this point is once you're told, oh, yeah, we did switch X and Y. Okay? So basically, when you switch X and Y, you actually flip-flop the domain and range. So the domain of the original is the range of the inverse domain of the inverse is the range of the original. And that happens because we switched X and Y. We call this a one-to-one, -one, and the idea is this word function. A function has an inverse that's a function if it's one-to-one. One-to-one -one just means one function mapping to another function. That's what it's referring to. Now, to determine a function... What you should remember is you use the vertical line test to tell something was a function. The horizontal line test told you if the inverse was a function. So that should sound familiar. I'll just put vertical line test tells you if it's a function. Horizontal line test. inverse function. So what we would say is if a graph 
passed both the vertical and the horizontal line test, that would mean that it's a one-to-one -one function, which means both the original and its inverse are functions. That's what we're referred to. So let's kind of look back at this guy. Here's my original right here. Well, if I'm just looking point A to point B, if I just left it there, A, it passes a vertical line test. Well, it also passes a horizontal line test. So what that means, if it passes the vertical and the horizontal, this function has an inverse that's also a function. Well, let's look at the inverse drawing. It passes the vertical line test. This passes the vertical because this one passed the horizontal. So this passing the horizontal means that this will be a function. So let's get a couple sketches here. There we go, our basic parabola. Okay. Hey, that's a function. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a function. Every x corresponds to exactly one y. However, it does not pass the horizontal line, line test. Everybody agree? Which simply means that its inverse is not a function. Are you okay with that? So we would say that this is not one to one. Because it does not pass that horizontal line test. It doesn't mean you can't graph the inverse. Okay? It doesn't mean that you can't switch every x and y and generate some graph. We're just saying that that inverse sketch would not be a function. As a matter of fact, if you reflect this over this dotted line, it would actually look like a parabola opening to the side. It would end up looking something like this. Which is not a function. It's still a graph, it's just not a function. Everybody okay with that? Now, if we see something like our basic cubic, these are our two basic graphs we deal with. We relate a lot of things off of them. This is our cubic. This would be one-to-one. -one. It passes the vertical line test. It passes the horizontal line test, which means if you were to reflect it and graph its inverse, its inverse would be a function. Are you okay with that? This is also, so here's our one new term for the day. This is also called a monotonic function. A monotonic function. Now that should be a brand new term for you today. Okay. Monotonic just means it is either strictly increasing or decreasing throughout. So this particular sketch here is increasing throughout. Strictly increasing, it never turns and goes down, so we call it a monotonic function. This one is not monotonic. It's not doing the same thing throughout. This one's decreasing, then all of a sudden it turns and starts increasing. So mono one, one direction. Okay, It's either increasing or decreasing. This one has both. Now, that doesn't mean that a graph doesn't have some monotonic regions or features. If I said, hey, you know what, from point A to point B, well, that would be monotonic. From this point to this point, that would be monotonic. From here to here, no. If I said through the entire domain, no. Okay. So I don't want to say that a sketch has to have be monotonic from negative infinity to infinity. We want to make sure that we're focusing on the domain we're given. Okay. If I'm not given a restriction, then yes, yeah, negative infinity to infinity. Right. And this one is monotonic from negative infinity to infinity. If I'm told to look from... 2 to 12. Well, I'm just looking from 2 to 12. I don't care about anything else. All right, so remember, domains can be restricted. All right. Let's review a little bit from algebra. I said find 
inverse. All right, start with f of x equals, let's go x plus 2. Right. So this is what you did in the past. Your first step was you switched x and y. First step, we switch x and y. So here x would be y plus 10. Remember, f of x was y. So I've switched x and y. My second step is solve for y. Solve for y, I'd have x uh, minus 10 equals y. Everybody agree with that? So if I leave this for y, we would write this as f inverse of x is x minus 10. There's my inverse function. There's my original. So we write the inverse with just that little negative one symbol. It doesn't matter if it's f or g or whatever. It's just a variable. If I saw f of x equals cube root x. There's my original. I switch x and y. x equals cube root y. I then solve for y, y equals x cubed, so f inverse of x equals x cubed. So I have original and my inverse. You okay with that? And here's an x cubed, and so a cube root looks something like this. over. Okay. okay there? Let's say, usually where we get into a little bit of trouble is on the fractions. If I said f of x equals 3 over x minus 2. So there's my original. I want to turn around, find that inverse. Well, my first step is going to be Switch um, x and y. x would be 3 over y minus 2. Now, I've still got to solve for y. This is where sometimes it gets to be a little bit of a pain solving for y. I've got to get rid of the fraction and so forth. Definitely more work than the first two. So what I do is I multiply both sides by y minus 2. It would cancel on the right. This would give me xy minus 2x is 3. I'll send that 2x to the other side. xy 2x plus 3. And last step, divide by x, right? So I'm just going to Put right as the inverse f inverse of x will be 2x plus 3 over x. So I've got original again and inverse. Okay. Now the first two that were done over there, the domain and range of the first two were negative infinity to infinity. In other words, there's no domain restrictions, no domain restrictions in the original, no domain restrictions in the inverse. Uh, if I get to the second one, no domain restrictions in the cube root, no domain restrictions in an x cubed. Then I get to the third. The third one does have some domain restrictions. What's the domain restriction of the original? X cannot equal two. All right, x cannot equal two. All right, what's the domain restriction of the inverse? 
and that equals zero. Does everybody agree with that? Now what this means though is the range of the original is y can't be zero and the range of the inverse is y can't be two because you flip the domain and range. You switch x and y, that switches the domain and the range. I'm not sure if you remember this or not, but you also did cover in the past, and we'll be talking more about these later, horizontal asymptote rules. You have rational functions. If the powers are the same, so horizontal asymptote is a leading coefficient, two over one is two. Why can't be two? If the top power was less than the bottom, it was zero. Why can't be zero? Now those are some little rules that kind of help you from the past, but what you want to make sure you are understanding is that since you switched X and Y to find that inverse, that's what switched the domain and the range. So even if you don't remember anything about range, we should be pretty good at domain when we look at functions. We've seen it enough times. Yeah, we screw up every now and then, but we're pretty good at it because we know what we're looking for. I can look at this and tell it's not zero. I can look at that and tell it can't have two. Pretty quick. Now the realization comes in, well, they're flipping because I switched X and Y to start with. Are you okay with that? All right. So well, let's switch it to this. Show that F of X equals one over one plus X and g of x equals one minus x over x are inverses. If I wanted to show that two things were inverses, I have a choice, I can find the inverse of f, see if I get g, or I can find the inverse of g, see if I end up with f. Okay. That will definitely prove one's an inverse of the other. Another thing that you did was you could check the composite. F composed of G of X. And I could do F composed of G or G composed of F. I'm just writing it as F composed of G because I see F up there first. So a composite function from your past is where you put one function inside the other function. So this is where we're going to put G inside of F. You originally saw it written like this, F, a little comp composite symbol, fog. F composed of G, that meant G was on the inside. So if I wrote it with G on the inside, it would look like this, F, 1 minus X over X. So I'm going to put G inside of F. That means that this Ugly as it may be, is substituting in for x. So I would have 1 over 1 plus 1 minus x over x. I could simplify it, but that's my base form of my composite function. To simplify this, I'm going to multiply everything by x. If I multiply everything by x, I will get x over x plus 1 minus x. That's x. If two functions are inverses of each other, and you find the composite function between the two, it will always end up with x, and the reason is y equals x was that line they were reflected over. That's where that's coming back to. That's why the composite function yields x. You compose one or the other, they're going to go together, and it's going to end up being right on that line y equals x. I could even go the other way. If I went g composed of f. So now I'm going to put f inside. When I work this out, I'm going to get x again because they're inverses. So if I said g composed of f of x, I'd have g of 
1 over 1 plus x. So now that's going in for into the g function for x at two spots. 1 minus 1 over 1 plus x all over 1 over 1 plus x. Kind of an ugly look there, but if I clean it up, simplify the fractions, I'm going to multiply everything by this denominator, 1 plus x. So that would give me 1 plus x minus 1 up top over 1 on the bottom. There's x again. Now the basic idea, now you shouldn't necessarily remember all the little details of an inverse function. What you should remember walking in today is, I've heard of an inverse function, and now especially that it's mentioned, I remember switching x and y. I don't necessarily remember why, looking at some of the things we've done so far today, you should remember why now, or what, what's really happening there. If you weren't told then, then it should make sense now while we're switching. It's creating that reflection piece over this as far as what's happening, which makes sense then why the domain and range are flip-flopping because you switched X and Y. Okay. We haven't really done anything in here as far as composite functions, but when you look back, that should look familiar now. Hey, you know what? I've done that before. It should make sense why I'm getting just an X because they are inverses. Coming back to that line. So you got a lot of things that you're mixing together that you've seen before. Not really remembered everything and maybe a couple things you didn't see, but it should make sense when you tie all the pieces together. It's the nice part. So now our second brand new piece today. First one was monotonic, that term. We see monotonic one direction. It's either always going up or always going down. My monotonic. Okay. Now let's look at the derivative of an inverse. All right, derivative of an inverse. F inverse prime of x equals 1 over F prime of F inverse of x. A fairly ugly looking formula there. Uh, some things in there now that we talked about should look familiar. <clears throat> okay, I know what a derivative is. That's, that sounds familiar. I know what an inverse is. Okay, that, that's familiar now, even if it wasn't the best when I started a few minutes ago. Pretty good there. Um, the notation. Hey, this looks familiar. Inverse function. Inverse, the prime's referring to the derivative. I'm seeing some things that look pretty familiar there. Okay. So let's kind of go through a problem. Finding a derivative of an inverse. I think a derivative of an inverse is pretty simple if you can find the inverse. So for example, f prime of x, or excuse me, not f prime, f inverse of x of this is x minus 10. So what's this derivative? 1. Pretty basic, right? All right. The inverse of this function is x cubed. So what's the derivative? 3x squared. The inverse of this one is 2x plus 3 over x. What's the derivative? Well, I can move the x up and work with powers, or I can do a quotient rule, but I can find that derivative. There's nothing unusual about that derivative. Everybody okay with that? All right. So let's say I'm given this function. Given f of x equals 3x to the fifth plus x cubed minus 2. And let's say I want to find the derivative of this inverse. I've got a big problem here. Just kind of think it through. If you were to switch x and y to go find the inverse, if you were to switch x and y, you would have a y to the fifth and a y cubed in there. There is no way you're going to solve that for y. You have two different powers. Right. Over here, I mean, these are some basic ones, but still, I've got just one y. I know this one's in a cube root, still just one y. 
I know this is in the denominator, but still just one y. I can solve for y. Now if I switch x and y, I'm going to end up with a y to the fifth and a y cubed, and there's no way I'm going to get y alone. I run into a little bit of a problem there. So sometimes derivatives of inverses are really, really nice because you can find the inverse, then just go get the derivative. This is going to help you when finding the inverse is not so nice. It's not easy to figure out. I'm not going to end up in that situation. All right, so let's do something like this. I'm going to use this function and say, hey, what is f inverse prime of negative 1? I want to find the derivative of negative 1. Derivative of the inverse at negative 1. First thing I need, I need the value of f inverse of x when x equals negative 1. I need that value. Well, at first glance, that sounds like, well, this is pretty simple. Okay. I need f inverse of negative 1. Seems pretty simple. Well, it's not simple because I don't know what the inverse function is. If I knew what the inverse of that was, well, then I just go substitute negative 1 and I've got my value. Everybody agree with that? Again, here's three inverses on the board. I can put negative 1 into any one of them. I can figure out a value. I don't have the inverse. So I need this value, but do not have the inverse. So now I have to kind of think, what do I do if I don't have the inverse? Well, if x is negative 1 on the inverse, then what was negative 1 on the original? Y. The y. There's your switching x and y. I know y equals negative 1 on f of x. If I want x is negative 1 on the inverse, that meant y was negative 1 on f of x. So I'm going to have negative 1 equals 3x to the fifth plus x cubed minus 2. I need to solve this. If I can solve that equation and get x, then I've got some pieces I need. So this is where it's going to go back to, we use our calculators before, go back to your solver on your calculator. Using your solver. Now, some of you have the model calculator where you had to have it equal to zero. If that's the case, move the negative one over. So you'd add one to get a negative one over here instead of minus two. Others, I know like my model calculator, I can put in the negative one. Okay, so remember, when you go to your solver, if it says zero equals, you got to solve that for zero. And I forget which models do that. I think the 83s do that. I can't remember if the 84s do or not. I think you have that equal to zero. So we've used our solver before. A little review today, trying to use it. It's been a while. Use solver on calculator. 
Okay, at x equals 0.73. I got 0.72812245. Remember, if you put your equation in, it's going to ask you to make a guess. You should come up with point, well, point 0.73 rounded off. Get over here. Well, you can leave it zero. Just move it to the other side. So your calculator makes it equal to zero, but just move the one. So then you'd have three x and fifth plus x cubed minus one. Which would still be the same equation. Good, good. So yours is always going to have you make it equal to zero. Just move stuff over if you got to. That's pretty easy to do. Day one. Okay. Now, here comes my important piece here. So I want to go find this derivative. So I want to find f inverse prime, in this case, f inverse prime at negative one. What I was asked for. One over f prime of point seven three. Now let's revisit that point seven three. What we were saying was if y is negative one on the original, that means x is negative one on the inverse. So if y is negative 1 on the original, x is 0.73 on the original, which means y is 0.73 on that inverse. So f inverse of negative 1 is 0.73. Are you okay with that? There's that switching x and y that we're talking about. Now my answer would be 1 over 15 times 0.73 to the fourth plus 3 times 0.73 squared. So f prime, here's my f. We know how to find a derivative, 15x to the fourth, plus 3x squared. I'm just substituting my 0.73 in to get that final answer. I got point one seven one. Now a lot of things going on here. Let's think back. This means this is the slope of the tangent line on the inverse function at negative one on the inverse function. We've got this formula here. What's making this formula more difficult is I cannot find that inverse. I'm kind of stuck there. I can't. I can't switch x and y and solve for y. So now I'm going back and using my inverse properties. Right? I need f inverse of negative 1. I need this piece to put in here. So f inverse of negative 1. I don't know the inverse, so I can't put negative 1 in, but this means negative 1 had to be y on the original. So I can solve that and get what x is on the original. So this would be the point. On the original, 0 0.73, negative 1. When you flip it to the inverse, it becomes the point negative 1, comma, 0 0.73. There's that y coordinate. Switch that x and y. The rest of this is pretty basic. You know how to find a derivative, and we're just putting 0 0.73 in. Not much going on there. Okay? 
The difficult part is tying that inverse of, wait, if I know a value on one of them, I know it's the opposite value on the other one. Right? Since I'm, I know X, it has to be Y. If I knew Y, that has to be X, flipping back and forth. So we found this point on the original, which meant the inverse point, or the point on the inverse, I should say, was negative 1, comma, 0.73, which is what gave me that value. Okay there? All right.